kind of, you know, learning about all of this stuff and being very excited about, you know, my new job and my new duties and all of this. And then we went into crisis mode and everything that we learned and everything that I was kind of preparing for in the beginning there sort of went out the window and we went into crisis mode. And, you know, being there and on the inside, you know, in what was called the marketing law department, so you can imagine it's full of lawyers there too, um, we had our focus set more on how can we make sure that we limit the company's liability. Not so much on how do we clean up this mess, that wasn't you know, much of a focus at all, we didn't really talk about that so much, but what can we do to save our butts over here at Exxon? And, and, and that was a real turning point for me. Um, I started to realize that, you know, companies can really be um, a, a force for good and sometimes, unfortunately, they can be a force for bad. So let's talk about another journey, and that's the journey of our planet and what's been going on recently with our planet. This is a nice picture here. This was in 1968, Apollo 8, and it was the beginning of the modern environmental movement. And if you can think about it, this is really the first time we got to see us. We never really knew what we looked like before. I mean, if you can imagine it at the time, up until then, we basically, as human beings, would sit here with our feet firmly planted on the ground, and we'd look up and we'd see this big, huge, vast sky, and that was it. We never knew what we looked like from the outside looking in. And here's the surface of the moon right here, and there we are um, looking at a big, beautiful blue planet. Here's another picture that I really like a lot. This is from Apollo 17. This is the last um, manned mission to the moon. And what was interesting about this particular picture is that the way they were situated is, as they were going around, the sun was directly behind them. So the whole entire planet was lit up into one big blue ball. <laughs> when he just turned the lights on, really funny. <laughs> Um, so the, the, uh, the planet was lit up into one big blue ball, and actually that is such an interesting picture, and it's so well liked that it's actually the most um, frequently reproduced um, picture of all time. So I wanted to show you this. You know, there's some skeptics out there who say that there's some warming and some cold, uh, cold periods, and um, they're kind of right. Up until about 1980 or so, if you look at the blue regions here, we're kind of talking about colder than warmer temperatures, colder than normal temperatures, and the red areas are warmer than normal temperatures. You can see the date going down here at the bottom, and you can see up until about 1980 or so, those skeptics were kind of on point. You know, sure there were colder years, and sure there were warmer years. But in the last few years, at least in the last couple of decades, we've had a lot more warmer than normal years than we've ever had before. And in fact, the 12 hottest years have all occurred in this century, except for one, 1998, that was a hot year then too. Uh, you can't see that so well. You know what, is it possible to turn that light down so you can see this a little bit better? The, thanks. <laughs> That's perfect, thanks. So, and in fact, I should change this because it's not 13 of the last 14 years, it's actually 14 of the last 15 years. 2014 was the hottest year that's ever been recorded. So, you know, to those skeptics who say, you know, gosh, you know, sh what are you guys talking about? It's, you know, nothing more than just normal fluctuations in the Earth's temperature. It's not a big deal, nothing to get me all excited about. You know, maybe, but up until about 1980 or not, even 2000, those aren't just normal fluctuations anymore. Those are called trends, and we're starting to pay attention to some of these trends. Here's another one. 2014 was a 38th consecutive year with a global average temperature that was above the 20th century average. Again, this is something to start paying attention to. This isn't normal fluctuations anymore. This is more of a trend that's happening. Globally, May 2014 was the hottest male record, and how hot did it get? We got, hot, we got heat in places we're not supposed to get heat. <laughs> Now look here in Freiburg, Germany, that's a very hilly area, it's not in the Alps, but it's just north of the Alps. It hit 104.4 degrees. It, I mean, that's unheard of in places like that. In Austria, it hit 104.9. It, it hit a new record for Austria a couple of years ago. In Japan, 105.8. That's just the regular temperature going outside. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go outside and it's about 95 degrees or so, I start to feel really grouchy. But when we hit 105, you know, 106, you know, that is something that really is, 
these people in these places, many of them don't have air conditioning, and it's just something that you can't really escape from. Now, you think people in the Middle East are used to hot temperatures, but nothing like this. This is 128 degrees, um, and it's probably the highest recorded temperature that we've ever even seen in Asia. So why is this happening? Well, you know, it all has to do with the atmosphere and what we're doing to that atmosphere. Um, this is a really neat picture. It's the surface of the Earth with the atmosphere, and you know, either the sunrise or the sunset. You can't, you can't really tell exactly. But that little blue band is very thin and it's very fragile. That's the atmospheric band. And I've heard some scientists refer to it as as thin as maybe a coat of varnish on a globe, you know, that you might have in your office, or maybe as thin as a piece of saran wrap on a basketball. That's how thin and delicate this, this protective layer is. And we're doing stuff to that protective layer. So let's go back real quick to fifth grade science class and figure out how this all works. Most of the radiation that comes in from the sun goes through that atmospheric layer and warms the earth. And that's a good thing. Some of it stays in there, and you can see over here that some of it's trapped, and that's a good thing. That's what makes life on earth possible. It has a natural heating and cooling, heating and cooling uh, system. You know, day and night, winter, summer, you know, it warms and it cools on, on a natural sort of systematic basis. That's a good thing. We want that to happen. The problem is we're impacting that natural system. And we're doing that by burning fossil fuels. Now, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, or natural gas, um, it produces CO2, carbon dioxide. And that CO2 goes up into the atmosphere and it stays there. It doesn't go away. Um, and have we been burning fossil fuels a lot more than normal? Yes, we have. And at the start of the Industrial Revolution over here, you can see that we hardly burned any fossil fuels. But then when we started to use that stuff to power our factories or transportation systems, to warm our homes, all kinds of things like that, we started to really see a huge increase in the amount of fossil fuels that we are using. And it's impacting this atmospheric layer. You can see here in this diagram that the atmospheric layer is a lot darker, it's a lot thicker, okay? And it makes it so that that natural heating and cooling, warming and cooling system doesn't really work so well. It stays in there, it, then the heat is trapped and it doesn't have the cooling part of it. Now this is probably the most uh, important graph of the whole presentation, so I want you to pay attention to this. <laughs> this is interesting because down here on the, on the horizontal axis at the bottom, it says years BP, and that means before present, okay? So zero down here means today. 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, all the way to 800,000 years ago, all right? And then over here on the, on the vertical axis, you can see that that's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's measured in parts per million. So the nice little blue line kind of fluctuates up and down and all of that, but one thing to kind of notice is that it really never gets too much above 300. I mean, it may have hit 300 right there, I don't know, maybe about there. But it stays right around, you know, a nice little, little sort of tightly defined area. All right, so the next thing, here we go, is temperature. And you can see that the temperature also fluctuates. And what's interesting is you can see very nicely there in this diagram that it's really a linked system. As CO2 goes up, temperature goes up. As CO2 goes down, temperature goes down. Then you're probably asking, how is it possible for us to know what the CO2 was in the atmosphere or what the temperature was in the atmosphere, you know, all these years ago? Because there weren't people around measuring stuff at that time. Well, just like a tree, you know, if you cut down a tree and you count the number of rings on that tree, you can see how old the tree is. It's the same thing with ice core samples, okay? Scientists can go up to the Arctic or all the way down to the Antarctic and they can drill a huge tube of ice into the ice, and they can count back the number of years, and they can count back 100,000, 200,000, all the way to 800,000 years ago, and they can look at that ice, and they can study it. They take it back to the lab, and what they do is they dissolve the ice. The inside the ice, of course, there's little teeny tiny bubbles of air. They look at the bubbles of air, and they can tell how much CO2 was in the air that day, 800,000 years ago, when the snow fell and turned into ice. How interesting is that? 
And because you can also make some assumptions about the, uh, the temperature, you can look at the amount of pollen and other kinds of things that are also in that air. And you can look at that and make some assumptions about what the temperature was like at that period of time too. So that's how we can go back and look and see what the temperature and what the CO2 may have been like up to even 800,000 years ago. Okay, that's where we are now, okay? At 400 parts per million. Now, over here we learned that so far in the last 800,000 years, we've never really gotten above 300. Now we're at 400. And another thing I wanted you to notice when you're looking at this uh, chart here is the difference in the white, okay? The temperature over here from the high point to the low point, that was actually the end of the last ice age. And from the top to the bottom, that's a temperature difference that's pretty significant. Up here at the top, it's a nice spring day here in Philadelphia. At the bottom, it's a mile of ice over our heads, okay? So when you look at that difference between a nice warm day in Philadelphia and a mile of ice over our heads, and then you look at that number up there, 400, what kind of temperature difference is that going to be? Okay, and this is one thing that's making scientists extremely worried. If we continue to burn fossil fuels at the current rate, this is where we're going to be in just 40 more years. All right? Again, something to be very, very concerned about. And we're already starting to see some effects. Just for an example, let's look at Australia. You know, when it's January down there, it's summertime. January up here, it's wintertime. January down in the summer, uh, in, in the southern hemisphere, it's summertime. So what happened in January 2013? Well, we noticed here, over here on the left-hand side, that's temperature, but it's measured in Celsius, okay? So they're predicting a huge swath of the middle of the country to be as hot as 50 degrees Celsius, which is um, about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't know if you realize how big uh, Australia is. I think a lot of Americans don't really realize, but if you take Australia and you just kind of put it on top of the United States, it's bigger than, than the United States. It's a big country. And you know, you can imagine if you kind of you know, compare that to the United States, that's a huge section of the middle of the United States that's predicted to be 122 degrees. A couple of days later, they actually had even bigger uh, predictions for more heat. It went up to 50 degrees, so 122 degrees. And the weather forecasters, they actually had to add two more colors to the chart. They've never had to do anything like that before because the temperatures that they were predicting were so unprecedented that they never even had to go up that high before, but they had to add two new colors to the chart to just take care of um, you know, the predictions and, and the temperatures that were forecasted for that area. This is um, happening, uh, Australia has been really hit pretty hard. This was the Australian Open last year in Melbourne. And this is uh, poor little Wilbert. <laughs> He's a 100 year old giant tortoise and it's, when it hits 104 degrees, you know, down there it gets pretty hot even for turtles. So, you know, we're, we're noticing that temperatures are really going up decade by decade. And here's, if you can look at this, this is the average temperature that we've had over the last decades, and you know, starting around 1980 or so, you can see that the temperatures are really quite a bit higher than the global average temperatures. And it's not just you know American scientists who are talking about this, it's people from all around the world. We have uh, UK centers, US centers, and even Japan are coming up, and they're basically saying the same thing, that global average temperatures are going up. And there's a connection between the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, the amount of fossil fuels that we're bur burning, and the amount of temperature increases that we're experiencing. Okay, so one good thing is that 90% of the extra heat is trapped by the oceans. Okay, so on one hand that's a really good thing because the atmosphere would, you know, it's experiencing a lot of additional heat. But the ocean is kind of working in our favor quite a bit by trapping a lot of that heat. So for us, it's kind of good. But this can continue for a long period of time. You can see global ocean heat content is increasing. The reason why we can't keep doing this for a long time, while the oceans can't keep having these higher temperatures, is because it's a, a, a powder cake of energy for big storms that go through. And this was just a couple of years ago. This was Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. 
you can barely even see the Philippines there, but you know, this is a nice little depiction, and you can see that you know, when we have warmer than normal temperatures, say, example, maybe nine degrees warmer than normal or so, you know, that's exactly where the typhoon picked up a lot of its energy and then actually wound up dumping that right on the Philippines. Now, and when, when it happened, we had absolute total devastation in the Philippines. I mean, look at that. There's nothing left of, um, you know, these cities, these people's houses, businesses, any of that stuff. Four million people were actually um, displaced by high end. And then you think about the scope of those numbers. Four million, okay, just a number on a page, but you know what? That's four million people that need to find access to uh, clean water to drink, sanitation, food, shelter, all of that stuff. Where do you find that for four million people? That's a lot. And, and you know, it's not just something that's happening over there. It's happening here at home, too. Does anybody remember what happened in October of 2012? Sandy. Exactly. You look at the pink and those are warmer than normal temperatures and you look at the blue, those are colder than normal temperatures in the ocean. And there we go right there. A lot more warmer than normal temperatures in the ocean and there goes Sandy right there headed for northern New Jersey and uh, New York. You know, I just have a few pictures here. I mean, I, there are many, many pictures. It's hard to pick. Um, you know, the emergency workers themselves being stranded. Here's a picture of uh, Chadwick Beach in New Jersey, that's before Sandy. Here's Chadwick Beach after Sandy. Mamalocking, New Jersey before Sandy. Have a look at this little house down here. All right, watch that. That's before Sandy. And they all, of course, look at all the other stuff too. That's after Sandy. You know, the house is psh, all the way out there in the water now. Uh, I mean, some of those houses, they're not, there's not even a trace of them even being there anymore. And, and so we're talking about huge, huge storms and impacting real people. Um, the only plausible explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is climate change. And this is written by Munich Re. Now, I don't know if you know who these companies are. There's Munich Re and then there's Swiss Re. These are the insurance companies that insure insurance companies. Okay, so if you have Prudential or State Farm or Allstate, these guys uh, insure those guys. So, so Munich Re and Swiss Re insure your Prudential and your State Farm and all those kinds of com uh, companies that you deal with. This guy said from Swiss Re, he says, what keeps us up at night is climate change. We see the long-term effect of climate change on society and it really frightens us. You know why they're paying attention? Because they're having to write a lot more claims. People are losing their houses, they're losing their cars, they're having all kinds of property damage and they're putting in claims and these guys are seeing it right away. And when you're talking about real dollar figures here, you better believe businesses are going to start paying attention to that. So here's the linkage between the climate crisis and the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events. As temperature increases, the oceans evaporate more moisture into the sky. Again, back to fifth grade science class again. And more evaporation means that more precipitation happens. That precipitation falls down and it makes its way out into streams and rivers and eventually the ocean. It goes up there and it's um, evaporated up again and the whole hydrological cycle continues. And that means that we are having bigger storms because warmer air can hold more water vapor. And in fact, it can hold for each additional uh, degree temperature increase, the atmosphere can hold 7% more water. And when there's more water up in the atmosphere, when a storm comes through, it falls down. Okay, so there's 7% more water up there. When those big storms come by, that's more stuff falling down in terms of uh, rain and snow. There's already about 4% more water vapor in the, uh, over the oceans than there were about 30 years ago. And it makes it so that the downpours get bigger and the snowstorms get bigger too. Leading to things like this. This is in Montana. You can see a teeny tiny little tree down there. I mean, it looks like a big mouth, doesn't it? You look at that and it almost looks like something out of a science fiction movie, but that's a fantastic picture to show like the scale and the size and the strength of that particular storm. There's been a huge increase in heavy precipitation days as the years have gone by, starting around Oops, sorry about that. Looking at the pointer. Yeah. 
So starting around, you know, 1990 or so, we're seeing a lot more heavy, heavy precipitation days. You know, summertime, you're supposed to have summer, spring, you're supposed to have, I mean, summertime, you're supposed to have rain, and, and spring and fall, you're supposed to have rain, winter, you're supposed to have snow, but not like this. Not like these kinds of big storms that we're seeing here in the United States and also around the world. And these are the kinds of things that we're seeing. I'm going to go through these so you can just see that around the world, it's not an isolated issue. It's not something that's just happening in one part of the world and it's impacting some people. It's impacting lots and lots of people in many different countries and many different cultures. Here's Canada. And you know, I have, <laughs> I have pictures that go back a couple of years. It's hard to pick them, you know, to show you. In Pensacola, Florida, about two, um, two feet fell, two feet of rain fell in about um, a day, 26 hours, leading to things like that. In Afghanistan, there were, what is it, 2,100 people were killed and 4,000 people were displaced by a massive landslide that happened in Afghanistan. Um, Washington, D.C., same thing, huge amounts of rain, which led to mudslides and, you know, devastating impacts on people's lives as they lose their homes. Croatia in 2014, Serbia, Bosnia, look at the little dog there, isn't he cute? <laughs> he just needs to get a ride out of there. Uh, he's cold and he's wet, he just wants to get out. Um, and, you know, look at the size of the mudslide here. You know, it's over top of the car, and people are trying to dig out and uh, get to their cars and get to their property again. That's Bosnia. The Solomon Islands flash floods killed 14 and left thousands homeless in uh, the South Pacific. You have Bolivia, China. I mean, that apartment building looks like it's about to go. Uh, with those raging waters there. This is India, and this is an interesting thing. In uh, one of the provinces of India, in the northeast corner, I think it is, um, 100,000 people had to be evacuated. Now think of that, 100,000 people had to be evacuated by these zip line kind of contraptions here. And all they could take with them was the, whatever they could hold on their back, whatever they could strap to them. Um, they just needed to get out and needed to get out quickly in order to save their lives. Here's Brazil. This is the Uttarakhand state in India. Again, <laughs> you can see a big statue with the water just raging against it. New Delhi. Now, in England and in Ireland, too, um, last year was the wettest year that they've ever seen. And you can see here in the dark blue areas, they have you know, more than 200% or 225% higher amounts of rainfall than they've ever had before, or, or you know, on average that they've had before. And here are just a couple of pictures of that. This was actually, they call this a, um, a trans-tropical typhoon, okay? Which means basically it's a typhoon that's supposed to stay in the tropical regions, but somehow it got out. <laughs> and it went up there to Great Britain, and it totally wiped out. You can see an outline of England there, and then a little bit of Ireland there, but it actually, you know, really devastated the whole country. And that was just last year. You can look at some of the effects of what happened here. You know, cars completely submerged, people going by on boats. Huge waves just coming in from the Atlantic Ocean, crashing into houses and buildings and so forth on the, on the coast there. Up in Scotland, you know, huge devastating impact. Sweden isn't all that far away. And a lot of those uh, if impacts hit them as well. Then you also had some other kinds of issues that were happening in other parts of the world, not just, you know, that particular storm system, um, but other kinds of things. And you can see the impacts of some of the water rise in some of these areas. You know, back in the day, what they did is they built these old towns and cities in areas that were high up. Sure, they had access to, um, you know, the river because for transportation and for drinking water and things like that. They needed access to clean water in a river system or a lake system or something like that. But they, they built the towns high enough up that they were kind of out of the way because sure, they realized that floods would happen every now and then, but they wanted to build the houses and buildings up high so they wouldn't be impacted. But now they're being impacted. So these, these places that have been here for maybe a thousand years are now being impacted. And here's a, a, t a city here a city center here, I guess I should say. And you can see that's the top of the first story. These are lights here, these little white things here, those are lights and, you know, I guess they had some tables and chairs out there so people could sit out in the courtyard and enjoy a nice day. Mo Mozambique in 2013. Again, some devastating impacts. Argentina, Greece. You can see it's happening all over. 
So as global temperatures continue to increase, the Earth's water cycle intensifies even more. It starts to go uh, as if it's on steroids. So the bigger, harder downpours that we're experiencing are also at the same time um, coupled with, with droughts. And you're probably thinking, how can we have all of these you know, huge storms and downpours and mudslides and all that other stuff? Well, at the same time, we're having droughts? How does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to show you. Over here on this side, you can see, and we've already sort of talked about this already, over here you can see that there's more evaporation from the ocean as the atmosphere increases, as, the, as, the, um, as it increases even more. As the air gets warmer, it can hold more water vapor. And that causes heavy downpours, and that causes even worse flooding. So we've kind of covered that stuff over there. The flooding and the worse downpours and all that other stuff. So what also happens is over here, though, at the same time we have increasing temperatures, we're also having snow packs that are melting. And when those snow packs melt earlier in the year, they lead to more spring flooding, but that means that there's less water in the heat of the summer when you really need it. There are longer intervals in drought-stricken areas between downpours, which makes the droughts even worse. And more water also evaporates more quickly from the soil, making the droughts deeper and longer still. So even the soil, which is supposed to nourish and hang on to plants in agricultural systems, it's not able to do that anymore because this, the, the water and the moisture that's in the soil is evaporated up and out as well. So this is how we're going to talk about this, talking about deeper and longer droughts. And you can see we're starting to experience that too. Here's Brazil, some cattle that have died again. And Brazil is getting hit hard this year too. I don't know if you've seen the news, but they are actually starting to have riots in terms of having access to water because there's no more water uh, to drink, no more access to clean water. New Zealand, um, the entire North Island of New Zealand was declared a drought zone in 2013. And an area of the Amazon rainforest that's twice the size of California continues to suffer from a long-term mega drought that began in 2005. So, I mean, you can even look at this, you can see a lot of these trees look like they are dying or in poor health, and that's something that's been happening for a long period of time now, for 10 years. The 2006-2010 droughts turned 60% of Syria's fertile land into desert. And by 2010, the drought had killed 80% of that country's cattle. Now, you know, you can't make a complete one-to-one -one causal connection between droughts and political unrest. But let's just say that it certainly didn't help, okay? When this guy is saying things like this, he said, I used to have 400 acres of wheat and now it's all desert. I mean, imagine that you've had this piece of land, you've uh, been able to sustain your family on this land for maybe generations, and now there's such a big drought that you actually have to leave your family home and your land and find someplace else to go, something else to do to survive. Um, those can be devastating impacts. And when desperate people are in desperate situations, they're going to do desperate things. Here's a refugee camp in Syria, and a million people had to flee their homes because of droughts. Now again, there can't be a one-to-one -one connection. You can't say that, but you're already in a stressful situation politically, and then you add on top of that the fact that you have this other huge stress of having to get up and find a new life for yourself and your family, the devastating impacts of losing your family, uh, your property, your family farm, all of those kinds of things lead to very um, desperate situations and desperate people, like I said, doing desperate things. At the Pentagon even, even in the US military, they're starting to realize that this isn't something that's uh, up for debate anymore. Over here, what they're saying is, for the DOD or the Department of Defense, this is a mission reality. It's not a political debate. The scientific forecast is for more Arctic ice melt, more sea level rise, more intense storms, more flooding from storm surge, and more drought. So our own military is looking at this as a crisis situation as well. Here's an example of previously productive agricultural land that is now uh, turning into desert. So sand dunes are starting to encroach on previously fertile land. And here's a really impactful picture. This is, um, this is in China near the Yellow River in China. All of this is agricultural land that's productive. It's providing food and sustenance for people, for their families. And now it's turning into big data. How do you hold that back? 
I don't know how you can hold something like that that's as big as a mountain coming your way, hold that back and kind of push it away and prevent it from coming into your land. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the drought in California. 100% of the state now is in at least a severe drought, and 25% is in an exceptional, an exceptional drought. This has been happening for several years now, and this year is also really, really um, disturbingly, they have disturbingly low amounts of snow. And you look down here and it says, at this time of year, the snowpack at this location averages about 40 inches. Okay, so, and in 2014 it was zero. And we're seeing the same effects this year. So what are those people going to use? I mean, California is a huge producer of agriculture for this country. It's a huge economic engine for them. We love to get our California lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers and all that great stuff. We're not going to be able to do that. And the economy is going to be, going to be really experiencing quite a bit of stress because of that, let alone just access to drinking water and so forth. And when it's dry, fires happen. So here's an example of, um, in California in 2013, Camp Pendleton in California in 2014. You know, when our military bases are starting to catch on fire, that's something that's pretty disturbing as well. It's not just here, but it's other places too, like Chile. I just love this picture in Australia. This poor little koala bear needs a drink of water, so the guy's helping him get a little drink of water. I had to keep that in there. Um, Australia, again, um, they've experienced huge amounts of fires and lots of devastating droughts. It's really impacted them as well. Look at this, this is an interesting picture. It has these people sitting on a beach watching the fire come. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You're sitting on the beach and there's a big fire coming down the hill. Now down there, it looks like they're standing up, so at least they can run away, but these guys over here at the bottom, they're just sitting there still. I guess they figure they still have time to run if they have to. Um, more pictures of Australia. So between 2010 and 2013, the Arctic ice um, the, the Arctic ice sheet lost ice at the rate of 160 billion metric tons per year. That's twice the rate at just, you know, um, a couple of years ago, from 2005 to 2010. And why do we care about the Arctic ice? I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, it probably doesn't impact you and me, but it will impact us as we start to think about how we can survive in a new reality. I wanted to show you just a couple more pictures. Here's um, a Cori Callas Glacier in Peru. This is 1978, and that's what it looks like today. Um, it took 1,600 years to form that glacier, and it only took 25 years to melt it away. This is one that I really like. This is the Muir Glacier in Alaska. And I like it because it's really old. It goes back to 1880, and what I want you to pay attention to is that little sliver up there. Can you see that? That's a mountain really, really far in the distance. So keep an eye on that, okay? That was 1880. That's today. Imagine that. So that is a huge difference when we're talking about, you know, glaciers melting and things that are happening. So again, don't ever listen to these people who are saying, oh, you know, it's just it's all made up, it's all, you know, fear-mongering and all of this stuff. It's not, it's real data, it's happening, and here's the evidence. Now, you know, thinking about different kinds of things like melting glaciers that are so far away, again, it probably doesn't impact you on a day-to-day -day basis. But here's four things that do impact you and I on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We have the food supply, we have water, global health and infrastructure. These are four big systems that are gonna have an impact on your day-to-day -day existence, just like my day-to-day -day existence. So let's go through these one by one. Let's first talk about the food supply. There you go. Now this is an interesting graphic because what it shows is different parts of the world that are net producers of uh, food and other parts of the world that are net consumers of food, okay? So you can see over here on this side, there's a huge surplus of food. In North America, South America, Australia, we produce so much food that we don't just kind of cover the needs for us here, but we also sell it to the rest of the world, okay? So we produce a lot of stuff, and then we send it out to the rest of the world, and where do we send it? We send it over here to these guys, okay? People who are in Central America, Western Europe, Asia, Middle East, and Africa, all right? So what's going to happen when we start to have more trouble producing some of this food? 
Because you know what, we're going to keep that food and make sure that our own citizens have access to that food as much as we possibly can, and it's going to be only a second choice to sell it to the rest of the world if we can, or to donate. We donate a lot of our food to the rest of the world too. And we're starting to see that those systems are starting to be stressed. Okay, so uh, we know that a one degree Celsius increase in temperature is projected. A projected mean temperature was found to decrease wheat yields by 21%. Just one degree and 21%, that's a huge impact. Another thing is we know that the more CO2 that's out there in the atmosphere, the less the level of nutrients are in different kinds of vital food sources like rice, wheat, and soybeans. Just a natural process that the plants don't have the ability to hang on to the nutrient levels that they normally are able to hang on to. And we are eating rice, wheat, and soybeans that is a lot, a lot less nutritious than it ever used to be just because there's more CO2 up in the atmosphere. And climate change is real. It's leading to an increase in plant uh, uh, pests and diseases as well. And, and I like how this guy right here sort of sums it up because it's like farming and health. You know, this guy is from uh, University of Illinois, and he says, farming is like far farming here is like farming in hell. Okay, so you can see that these systems are really are starting to become stressed. So that's food. Let's talk about water. Water is another area where we really have a lot of concerns. So we know that water is used for different kinds of things, but mainly 70% of our water goes to agricultural uses. And, and we know that as temperatures increase, so does water consumption. And when it gets hot outside, we want to drink more water. The plants need more water. We need more water for things like industry, livestock, and energy, those sorts of things as well. So we know that happens, and as temperature increases, we have few, you know, less access to clean drinking water, but we have more of a demand for clean drinking water too at the same time. Let's talk about global health. Climate change is disrupting natural ecosystems in a way that is making life better for infectious diseases. You know, different kinds of um, insect-borne diseases and ailments are starting to co show up in places where they've never been before. And, you know, you can look at this and you can see, well, this is kind of why it's happening. Over here, you can see that mosquitoes are actually moving to higher elevations. On, on that side of the chart, you can see that around about before 1970 or so, what happened is like the cold ice packs that were up there at the top of mountains made it such that um, mosquitoes sort of stayed down lower, you know, to the lower levels of elevation and the different kinds of plants and the other kinds of things, you know, that they were, you know, that they used that were common to their uh, environment stayed down there as well. And in fact, back in the day, a lot of cities were built on elevations that were kind of a little bit higher up outside the mos mosquito line. So if some of these mosquitoes did come by, that's okay. We're high enough up, they never come this high, it doesn't bother us. But then today we're having a different situation. Now these ice packs are melting, mosquitoes are traveling up higher onto the mountains, they're making their home at higher levels of elevations, and we're finding it that those kinds of diseases that mosquitoes like to spread around are starting to spread around in places we've never seen them before. Here's an example, these tropical diseases that are on the move. We see the West Nile virus, the Rift Valley fever. This is where they started, and with a little start. You can see that they started here in places like Africa, and now they're migrating to all places, all of the places, all around the world. I mean, look at this red one. Dengue fever started over here in red, in China. And now it's all around the world. It's over here in the United States even, in the southern part of the United States. We're seeing dengue fever over here. That's unheard of. You never heard of it. It's one of those things that you had to get a shot for if you traveled. But you don't see it in, in you know, Louisiana or Alabama or some of those places. It's also in Europe now too. And then infrastructure. Infrastructure is going to be impacted as well by these things. So this is a this is a great example right here. If you can see this right here, this is down here at the bottom. I don't know if you can see, this is an airplane, and the tires have embedded themselves in the, the runway at Reagan National Airport, okay? And in 2012, it was so hot in July of that year that this happened to quite a few planes. So you can imagine yourself getting on a plane, the, the stewardess or the steward gets up there and starts going through all of the safety, you know, discussions and things like that about where the exits are, blah, blah, blah. 
And then all of a sudden the pilot gets on and says, guess what, we have to get off the plane. <laughs> if we can't move, we're stuck. Um, and that's why, is because it was so hot that the tarmac melted and the plane melted itself into the tarmac. We have things in other places too, and because of storms and so forth, we're seeing huge impacts on bridges, um, highways, the Trans-Canada Highway in Alberta, Canada was um, shut down for a couple of days uh, because of a huge mudslide. They had to bring out huge numbers of trucks just to take all that mud away from the highway just so people can go back and forth and continue. Here's some railways in England, in Bosnia, back to Australia again. A sea level rise of one meter would flood Melbourne's cargo shipping docks, cargo storage yards, the Docklands Development Roadways, and the Stony Point Rail Line. Okay, again, what is that going to do to infrastructure and the economy and the people who depend on those jobs and the kinds of products that come through on those transportation systems? So we know we have to make a change. And I know that it can be really <laughs> depressing information to look at all of this stuff all the time. So what I want to do is I want to leave you with a little bit of a note of optimism here. Um, one thing is we can't be so arrogant to think that a civilization can't go extinct. It's happened before. But if we're smart about it, we can make a change and we can make sure that the fate that these guys saw isn't something that we're going to see. And this guy right here is the guy that gives me hope. This is the guy that gives me optimism. This is a guy who's 14 years old, he's in Malawi. And what he realized is that the, 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 um, the well in his village that used to pump water, the, there was a, it, it, it gave inconsistent access to water. Sometimes the electrical system ran and the pump worked, and sometimes they shut off the electrical system and they couldn't get access to clean water in his village. So he said, okay, we're not going to rely on the electrical system anymore. So what he did is he decided to come up with a solution of his own. So he went to the local dump. He got some a scrap metal, and he got a bicycle tire, and a wheel, and all of that stuff, and he scrapped it all together, and he made a windmill. That way, he has, and his village has, consistent access to clean water anytime they want. They don't have to worry about the line going down. They have the wind that can provide them with access to clean water. And I look at this guy, and I think, my gosh, with everything he probably has going against him in his life, if he can do this, then surely we can do stuff too. All right? So he is the guy that gives me optimism when I do get down. And these other guys give me optimism too. Every National Academy of Science in every major country in the world confirms anthropogenic global warming. Anthropogenic means made by man. Okay? That it's us. It's not just something that's happening out there. It's not a normal fluctuation. It's us and we're doing it. Okay? And every National Academy is confirming that it's us. We're doing it. The number of national academies that reject anthropogenic global warming, there aren't any. Every major scientific society in the world in fields that are related to global warming also confirms this. So you have reef science, global science, you have uh, geoscience, you have forestry, you have medical organizations, forest and wildlife. All of these organizations around the world that are nonprofit organizations, they all confirm global warming and that it's happening. We have the solutions at hand. And, and what's exciting is that these things are happening. You know, you look at the passionate people that are working on this issue and the, the different strides that they are making, you can't help but feel optimistic. Back in 2000, they made some predictions about, okay, this new technology, solar technology, what's going to happen? What might happen in terms of how can we predict how fast it's going to take off, all right? So in 2000, they made some predictions, and they said worldwide wind capacity will reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. So looking at all the demand and the prices and what might uh, the different kinds of uh, organizations that might get onto this and provide funding for this, probably by 2010, we'll probably reach about 30 gigawatts of wind. What really happened is this. By 2013, they actually exceeded that by a factor of 10. All right, that's exciting stuff. In 2000, uh, they also made a prediction about uh, China and how much wind China would install. They said by about 2010, China will probably install about two gigawatts of wind energy, uh, wind production energy. What happened in China? That was 22 times greater than that. I mean, that's a huge 
uh, thing to be excited about. And it might even reach 70 times that by 2020. China is going crazy in terms of the production of solar cells and wind and all of that stuff. And here's just a couple of examples of that. In Australia, wind energy is now cheaper than uh, electricity from new coal or gas plants. In England, they have the solar array off of the coast, and it can actually power 4, uh, 470,000 homes just by wind. Isn't that exciting? Turkey, we're seeing the same kinds of things. And um, India plans to quadruple their uh, renewable energy generation by 2022. Mexico, same thing. They're investing heavily in wind farms. The annual solar um, uh, pho photovoltaic, so it's just solar energy production, solar cells, by country. Look at over here. Look at what's happening. If you can look over here, I wanted to point something out about this graph in particular. Here's the U.S. in blue, okay? Look at us down there. That's us. Now look at Taiwan, little purple Taiwan. Taiwan is this big, okay? Why is Taiwan beating our pants off over there? That makes no sense at all. How are we as a country letting that happen? So there's the U.S. in blue. There's Taiwan way up there. And, well, China's just a game changer when they get into the, uh, into the fray of all of this. Then there, you know, solar power is being uh, developed in such a way that it can be for small installations and small issues and then for bigger installations. Here's just a small one. You can strap this to the top of your grass hut if you live in Africa and you can at least keep your lights on at night and maybe even power your cell phone too at the same time. And that's a good thing. That's a solar and it's, it's accessible. Energy is being made accessible for people all around the world. The solar voltaics um, cost, the cost per kilowatt hour for solar power is going down. The more time, the more of this that people buy and install, that the price per unit is going down. I mean, it's, it's Econ 101. Anybody who's ever taken economics knows that the more you produce of the stuff, the lower the price goes on a price per unit basis. Battery costs are also going down in terms of um, electric and hybrid batteries. You know, if you have a hybrid car, you're thinking about an electric car, look at the price and how the battery prices are going down. That's another really optimistic thing to think about. Western Australia, look at all these solar cells and the Vatican. <laughs> I like this new guy, right? Look at the Vatican and all of the uh, um, solar cells they have over there. Awesome. Here's the Philippines. That's in Spain and in California. This actually powers up to, what is it, 140,000 homes in California. So we're seeing, we're, we're turning the page. We're starting to see huge advancements. In Yuma and Arizona, this is the world's largest fully operational solar facility. And so far, what was really exciting um, is in 2010, for the very first time, the amount of investments that were made in renewable energy exceeded the amount of investments that were made in fossil fuel energy. Okay, that's exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it's been that way for the last five years too. The amount of money that we're spending on renewables is greater than the amount of money that we're spending on fossil fuels. So by 2030, Europe has pledged to cut its emissions by 40%. <coughs> and to produce 27% of its energy from renewables. And we're seeing little bits of progress here back home. I know we have some huge political battles that we still have to deal with, but small regions of the United States, we're getting in on it too. There's a regional greenhouse gas initiative for these nine states over here in the Northeast, unfortunately not Pennsylvania, um, and they're talking about coming up with um, different kinds of caps on the amount of um, CO2 emissions, and if you exceed those caps, what to do about it, and so forth. In California and in four Canadian provinces, they also have, they're working on an agreement right now, and they also have some preliminary uh, agreements um, that they're going to do. Paris 2015, um, already there are people getting together, writing up agendas, coming up with some preliminary things that they've agreed to or that they plan to agree to, and countries from all over the world are supposed to descend on Paris in December.